Welcome to the show, friends. Today, we're talking all about mindset. How really, you getting what it is that you want in life lives on the other side of being able to break through your own perceived limits and smash through your mental barriers. We'll learn why getting what you want in life requires you becoming a different person and how that journey can often be arduous and challenging, but it's supposed to be, and that there are tools and techniques that you can use to navigate this change process so that your radical health becomes a formality. I'm gonna talk about some strategies around why this subtle energy of resistance exists, why change is difficult, and what we can do when confronted with it to move through it so that we can be our most evolved self and reclaim our radical health. Let's get into the show. Okay, friends, so why is change so hard? I'm sure you already know that change is hard, right? You might be trying to make change right now. You might have tried to make change in the past, and you might have unfortunately failed on that endeavor, as many of us have done. And if you've accomplished anything meaningful in your life, or you've really kind of set some goals and worked through them, I think you'll already know that that wasn't the easiest thing. You had to work really hard to push through and to really expand and become somebody different. And that's what we're focusing on today, because change is hard. And it's kind of supposed to be because it kind of runs against our evolutionary hardwiring to stay the same because the same is safe and the same is predictable. And we like that. And change is not that. Change is new. It's exciting, but it's also scary, right? And there's a lot of fear there. And with that fear comes the doubts and the insecurities and this little pull and this tension inside that wants to keep us just playing it safe. But we know that there's no growth in comfort but there's also no comfort in growth. <laughs> so this growth thing brings about an element of discomfort. And I would call these growing pains. And these growing pains are signs. They are signals that you're on the right path. But if you kind of shy away when, this, the, when the going gets tough, if you shy away when the growing pains come, you'll never really have what it is that you want because everything that you want lives on the other side of that. It lives on your ability to move through that resistance and push. Because if you want something that you've never had before, you must be willing to become somebody that you've never been before. Yes, that requires a lot of doing new things, eating new ways, moving new ways, thinking new ways. But fundamentally, your health and who you are is an expression of your entire being, your identity, your habits, your thoughts, your beliefs. And if we're gonna change all of that, it's a pretty big task. But I'm here today to tell you that it's possible because I've done it, thousands of other people have done it, and we're gonna now help you do it. So what is this whole game about? Why is it so difficult? Why can't we just close our eyes, manif manifest our reality, and get what we want most out of life? It's because of this subtle energy of resistance. It's this fundamental tension that exists within all human beings when they're trying to make a change. It's a universal law that is as real as gravity. It's not just yours. It's not unique and personal to you. It's, it's impersonal. And every person experiences resistance in their own ways. For some people, it's self-sabotage. For other people, it's a lot of anxiety and doubt and fear and insecurity. Resistance is unique and at the same time, impersonal. It's something that we all go through, we all face, and we all have to learn to move beyond and master because it will become our master if we cannot master it. And there's a tension inside of us that exists, like a universal tug of war between who we could be and who we are right now. If you're listening to this podcast, you're a seeker. You're a growth seeker. You want to be healthier. You want to be better. Whatever that means to you, whether it's just about health or career or family or values, you want to grow and you want to expand. And you know that who you are right now is not the fullest expression of who you could be. And that our goal is to use the radical health framework to get you to the point where you can be your radical self, but also knowing that we're going to meet resistance along the way. And this resistance actually exists predominantly as an evolutionary mechanism for survival, for ensuring survival. It's part of our evolutionary hangover, if you will, that our genes are a little mismatched to our modern environment, that we're kind of hardwired for scarcity, but we now live in environments of abundance. And it's very confusing and it's very disorienting. So we feel this tension inside. 
If you sit with your body, you feel it. Like when your head hits the pillow at the end of the day, you feel it because your conscience is there. And it's either giving you a nice pat on the back and saying, good job. Or it's that knowing voice that's saying, come on, you could be more. Life is worth more. You could be healthy. You could make better choices. And if you're having a hard time making better choices, it's not because you're a flawed human. It's not because you're not good enough or any of those things. It's because resistance just has a hold of you right now. It's a little stronger than that higher self could be, than that wise self could be, that your potential is waiting for you to become. And that's how I like to frame it. We've got this tug of war going on at all times. Kind of like the angel and the devil on the shoulder we see in cartoons and movies, right? One voice is saying, get up early and eat an animal-based diet and go for a walk and put your phone down a little bit more. And this voice is saying, hit snooze and get the croissant <laughs> and skip the gym and just waste an hour of your life on TikTok. And it's always there. We feel it. If you have no tension in you right now, that's wonderful because it means you're in alignment. And I would just encourage you to keep going. At some point, anticipate that tension is going to come back because it's this conflicting inner argument, if you will between the wise self and the wounded self. This push and pull between the higher self and the lower self. And the uncomfortable truth of that is that most of us have just spent a lot of time in that lower self energy, that place of doubt and insecurity and fear. And one of my favorite acronyms for fear is that fear is really just false evidence appearing real. It's these stories that are not really real, they might have a shred of evidence because you've got some evidence in the past that you've failed or that you've been heartbroken or that diets don't work for you or whatever it is. But the past does not have the power to define the future. But that means we need to question these stories. And that means we need to not be so quick and beholden to that lower self, to that wounded self, to listen to the voice of our higher self, to ask in these moments of choice because you are choosing and what you are not changing you are choosing. So we have to take our power back in that game. Personal responsibility of choice. To choose to be our most evolved self. To ask questions like, what would my higher self do in this situation? What would my most evolved self do in this situation? It's a very empowering question and a very confronting question too because it shows you just how difficult it is to be your potential, to be all that you could be. It's not easy, but maybe we don't want it to be easy because maybe we know when we do hard things and there's nothing harder than breaking the habit of being yourself, that that's where we find meaning and that's where we find growth. So we have to go on this journey. We have to face this. We have to move through this tension. There's no other way around it. And we have to understand why this exists and ultimately that it's not an enemy that needs to be beaten because it's trying to keep you safe. Like I said, it operates from scarcity. It's this survival mentality that has served us so well for our entire evolutionary timeline. We have this pessimism bias, right? We often give way more weight to the potential negatives than the potential positives because this ensures survival more. We have a brain and the brain is designed to help you survive, not to help you thrive. So in many instances, your brain and your mind and this scarcity mindset is working against you. It's working against your growth, which is why we need something different, right? If we do what we've always done, we're gonna get what we've always gotten and we want something new. So we must be willing to do new things and become somebody new. So everything that you've gone through in your life so far, from the most traumatic experiences to these micro things along the way, from accidents and job losses and heartbreaks and everything else in between, you start to form your identity. You start to believe this is the way the world works. And because you survived, because you're here watching this right now, well, it did work. So you start to form beliefs around things. And if this happens again, then this is how I'm gonna move through it in the future. But the way that you learn to respond to life when you were 12 years old might not be serving you when you're 20 years old. And the way that you handled navigating change when you were 16 and you failed might not be the same way that you need to handle it now at 30 years old. But so often these threads of our past and our identity and our limiting beliefs that emerge from those place limit our ability to move forward into a better future for ourselves. Because the brain 
and the ego in this protection mode is trying to do just that. It operates from this paradigm of predict and protect. It's trying to protect you from feeling a familiar painful thing that you experienced in the past by attempting to predict the future. But your brain and you cannot predict the future. You might have a vague idea of what it looks like when you make certain choices, but you cannot predict the future. Nothing's guaranteed. And the mind doesn't do well in those spaces of ambiguity and not knowing. So the way it tries to predict the future is to keep everything the same because that's safe. Even if inside it makes us, because we know it's not what we want. We know there's something more for ourselves, but the mind wants to keep you doing all the same things, same people, same food, same thoughts, same patterns, because it's predictable and it's safe. It ensures survival. But the cost of that survival might be our spirit. It might be our joy. It might be our happiness. So we need to be able to leave it behind. Again, we need to leave that comfort zone because our comfort zone are really where our dreams go to die. And there's nothing comfortable about that. And that means we've got to embrace the discomfort that comes with change and start listening to that wise self a little bit more. Start listening to the call of that higher self to question what's going on here between the ears. And to listen a little bit more of what's speaking through here in the heart. They say the longest journey a person will ever take is this one. And it's between the head and the heart. Like 10 or 12 inches and it's the journey of a lifetime. To get these things working in conjunction. And not be so trapped at the level of the mind. Full of this fear. The false evidence appearing real. Full of the scarcity, the doubts and the insecurities. But more from this place in here of empowerment, from the heart, courage, shoulders back, chest forward, knowing that change is difficult, but it's what you have to do because it's, it, it's baked into the cake of who you are. It's an evolutionary requirement to grow and evolve. And when you do, it's the best feeling in the world because it allows you to be a better person, better person for you, first and foremost, to fill your cup up so you can give more of yourself to life, more experiences, more joy, more happiness, more relationships, more impact all of the real things that we want in life to really empower us to be rich in the currency of happiness, the thing that all of us are searching for, the thing that all of us really want. This, what we're doing here, Radical Health Radio and empowerment of bringing you on that journey with us is for that, is to try and give you the keys to that inner kingdom, the kingdom of joy and service and mastery and health because it's bloody wonderful <laughs> and we want that for you. So the reminder here is to take it slow and be kind to yourself because change is a process. Nobody changes anything overnight. And so often the reason that we fail is because we set ourselves up for unrealistic expectations. We think that we're gonna just click our fingers and become a different person overnight. And that's a long way to fall. And when we fall, we add another little penny to the piggy bank of not being good enough. And we failed again, so we'll fail again in the future, but it's not true because we're gonna do it differently. We're going to do it in from more of this aligned space now. And all you need to do is be 1% better every day. You don't need to be 100% better starting now. You need to understand that habits and identity are really what's going to drive your change. And that's a process. And it takes time to unfold into the fullness of who you are. But if you can give me that, if you can give me 1% better every day, you can do that. It's sustainable. And it might not sound that sexy at first. Because you might want to be 50% better starting right now. But I'd rather you go slow and steady and be in this for the long run than go hard and fast and be nowhere to be seen 21 days from now. Because this takes time. It takes patience, consistency, and resistance is coming. And we move through it day by day, one day at a time, listening to that wise self. Setting ourselves up for the most success possible from both a practical standpoint and a psychological standpoint. To ground this and, and wrap it up in a real tangible example. We're all here because we're interested in food. And maybe we've tried diets in the past. And maybe we failed at those diets in the past. And there's a couple of layers to why we've maybe failed. Maybe it's because we didn't have this awesome animal-based framework. And maybe it's because we were in this sense of deprivation and starvation. And we were doing the classic eat less and move more. And we were removing all the things in life that made us feel good. And we were stressed at work on top of all that. Now our metabolism is coming down. All we can think about is food 
And that's not fun. And if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. If it's not sustainable, you can't be consistent. If you're not consistent, you'll never have what it is that you want. So yeah, we use practical tools. We set ourselves up for success. We curate our environment. We throw out the rubbish. We get rid of the processed foods. We stop eating the seed oils. We build our diet on this animal-based pyramid. Protein and fat from nature's most abundant food sources. Animal proteins. We eat honey, maple syrup. We eat fruit. We eat raw milk and raw dairy and cheese. Like wonderful nutrient-dense foods that satiate us, keep us full, keep us fueled. But then we also look at the psychological levels that we find comfort in many things. And often that is food. And maybe we meet our unmet needs through the pint of ice cream or the cookies and the cake. Or maybe if our environment isn't set up, that it's hard to navigate when life gets stressful. So we have to kind of look at this holistically, practically, spiritually, mentally, and everything in between to find the steps that's going to ensure that we can go 1% better every day, that we can turn one day into two days, two days into a week, a week into a month, and months into years, because that's how we're going to become our radical health and achieve and actualize our radical self. So without further ado, it's time to bring in some callers to the show and answer some questions and continue spreading this message and spreading this wisdom. All right, team, it is time to take some callers. So we have uh, Jamie on the line that's calling in from New York and might have a question here about sunburn. Jamie, are you with us and how can we help you today? Yeah, I had a question about um, the correlation between having a heavy amount of seed oils in your diet and getting sunburns. And generally, how long should you try to be off of seed oils in order to start exposing yourself more to, to sunlight without um, getting any skin damage? Mm. I love this question, Jamie. Thank you very much for asking it. As the listeners can see on the show, I am a ginger from the northwest of England who had a pretty terrible time with sun throughout my childhood when we would go on family holidays and vacations to Spain, a um, lot of sunburn. And it's been very interesting for me to unpack this topic and learn sensible sun exposure and how an animal-based diet can really influence it. But I'm just curious, Jamie, is this something you struggle with frequently? You know, if you take a vacation or you go down to the beach in the summer, do you find that you get sunburned quite easily? What's the story there? So I don't get sunburned too easily, but um, I definitely have to put sunblock on. I have like Irish background and English background. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something I have to worry about. And yeah. obviously like all the time I'll get, have my like, family members and friends like say that you have to put on sunblock and, and you do, but, um, I know that there is, <clears throat> uh, there's some disadvantages to wearing sunblock. Yeah. Um, like spraying certain chemicals on your skin. Yeah, um, you've got it, man. So I, we would we would we would kind of push back a little bit and say that you don't necessarily need to go right towards the sunblock for some of the you know things you just started to allude to. They they obviously have fragrances and some pretty you know inflammatory toxic um, chemicals that can leach into the skin. There's plenty of studies showing that this is you know a, a thing that actually happens now. I mean our our skin is the largest organ on our body, and our body absorbs what we put on the skin. Um, so we want to basically deprioritize that as much as possible. And if we do need to go down that route, there are safer uh, natural alternatives, things like zinc-based uh, mineral sunscreens. But what we'd always try to do first is prioritize kind of building up our solar callus and sensible sun exposure, ramping up with the seasons, but also combining it with this magical ingredient of an animal-based diet and really zooming in on this thing that you started with, which is what's the seed oil story in this sunburn story? And the reason, again, I, I, I really like speaking about this topic is I used to get sunburned very easily for a long time, but all, my, my diet was the standard Western diet. You know, I was basically built off grains and seed oils and I couldn't be in the sun for more than 15 minutes uncovered without turning beet red and, you know, the peely shoulders and the whole story. Now, what's very interesting now coming full circle is I travel quite a lot for, you know, various reasons, retreats. And I was just in Mexico for my brother's wedding and the entire trip out there didn't need to put sunscreen on once and would be spending hours outside per day. But it's because I've built up this tolerance to the sun and it's because I've removed these seed oils from the diet. 
you've got to think about the chemical structure of seed oils. And when we say seed oils, we're thinking of things that are very common in our, you know, modern food structure, canola oils, corn, soybean oil, etc. that's in our packaged foods and what restaurants cook with. And you got to remember that we kind of, we are what we eat, right? We're built on the building blocks of what we put in our mouths. And these linoleic acid rich, polyunsaturated omega-6 rich um, fats and oils are very prone to oxidation. Uh, they, They degrade quite quickly in the presence of heat, light, and oxygen. And if you think about that, I mean, it's it's pretty much being outside. We're, we're under, you know, intense UV rays. And our, our fat cells are just under the layer of the skin. They become, can become oxidized very, very easily. So they're not very stable. Um, they're very susceptible to damage and that radiation from the sun, which is why removing them, and you said like how long and how much do we recommend removing them? Well, we want you to remove them completely from the diet as much as you possibly can forever because they don't do anything for your health. They are actually one of the biggest drivers of our chronic health epidemic. So if we get those out of the diet and we replace them with the fats that come from nature and our animal-based fats, which are much more safe, they're much more um, s- structured. They they have a, a much higher resilience to heat and oxidation. The saturated fats that come from animals like butter and ghee and tallow, these are a much more sensible fats to include in the diet from a metabolic health standpoint, but also a protection standpoint from exposure to the sun. And if you combine that animal-based principle of removing these things that potentially or probably do make you more susceptible to uh, sun damage from radiation from UV rays, and then slowly start to ramp up to build your solar callus, you have an evolutionary consistent approach to sun exposure. Because if you think about our ancestors for a second, they didn't go from a, a massively indoor lifestyle and then go and fly to Mexico to then try and sit out in the sun for six hours and get an intense sunburn. They were always outside. So they were ramping up their sun exposure as we entered into the spring. And by the time it was peak summer where the UV index was an eight, nine, 10, or even 11 and 12 in tropical regions and climates, they had this ability to build up slowly. They, they kind of titrated with the sun. Using an exercise analogy, it would be like expecting to bring somebody into the gym and get them to back squat 225 on their first session. It's not realistic and you're gonna hurt people. But that's kind of what we do with sun. A lot of us live 80% of our lives, 90% of our lives inside under artificial lights. And then we go, you know, it's the summer and we go to the beach and we get burned. And we blame the sun and we say, you know, sunburn is terrible, which it is. It can cause damage, but it's not necessarily the sun. It's our lack of exposure sensible to the sun. And then we cake on these toxic sunscreens on top of all of that because we've got this, you know, diet that's high in polyunsaturated fats. And we've kind of got this perfect recipe for sunburn and free radicals and oxidative stress. So I would encourage you to slowly ramp up as the seasons change. Of course, you're in New York and it's the winter right now. So, you know, there, there are things you could do, but basically as we start to enter into the spring it's spend as much time as you can outdoors and at that point you'll have a good amount of months under your belt on an animal-based diet and just start slowly i i I really recommend downloading um the app it's called d minder like vitamin d uh, d minder and it will tell you it will use your location and it will tell you the uv index and it will even give you some sensible sun exposure tips based on your skin tone and the amount of clothes that you are or are not wearing it might say you have 20 minutes of safe sun exposure today and after that time frame is up don't necessarily then reach for the sunscreen but maybe put on a wide brimmed hat maybe put on a long sleeve shirt and protect yourself from the sun with safer ways uh, than just just layering on those sunscreens. And in extreme circumstances where you cannot do that, maybe you're out fishing and you're gonna be out for hours and hours on end, then you need to go for sunscreen options, then opt for more natural mineral-based sunscreens like a, a, a zinc or something like that. I think that combination of building up your solar callus, fixing and, and building your diet on an animal-based diet with a removal and focus on getting rid of those seed oils and then sensible sun exposure using some cool technology like D-Minder, you're gonna have a great summer and you can navigate through, hold a tent and not get sunburned at all. And that's kind of what we want, right? So uh, I hope that's helpful, Jamie. Uh, thanks for calling into the show. Next on call, we have Chip from South Carolina. Chip, it seems you just started an animal-based diet and you have some questions for us. What's going on, my friend? I appreciate you taking my call. I've been experiencing, man, some incredibly uh, incredibly strong fatigue. Mm. Um, Just felt horrible uh, yesterday. Some even on day one, but yesterday was really bad. And then this morning, 
um, just didn't didn't feel well. Is, yeah. is that normal? Uh, what is that an indication of? Yeah, it could be a few things, Chip. So I think we need to dig a little bit here and get some more information. So you just started an animal-based diet. So I would love to hear what that means. Is that a few days? Is that a couple of weeks? And give me kind of like a, a high-level overview of what your days are looking like around your food intake right now. And then we'll have a little more information to work with. Well, I started the animal-based diet on um, Tuesday. Yeah, today is the day three. Cool. And um, I typically get up and uh, try to uh, exercise in the morning and then eat uh, after exercising. Then I'm uh, in the study because I'm a minister. Cool. And so I, I do sit down for a while, but I regularly get up and walk around. I try to stay moving. I'll uh, I'll eat lunch and then more uh, work, uh, sitting down typically, and then uh, I'll have supper. And the evenings are usually a mixture of uh, volunteer firefighter training and then ministry and then just trying to rest. So. Yeah, beautiful. So you said you eat three meals a day, which is a good start, but can we get a little breakdown of what those meals look like? Obviously, you're trying to follow an animal-based diet, and it's only a couple of days into this thing, but give me a, a quick little look at uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, please. Okay. Um, well, just yesterday, when I really felt the worst, when I got up, I did drink eight ounces of raw milk, and uh, let's see. So yesterday, yesterday I just had my breakfast. I had like uh, six or eight pieces of sausage, real small pieces of sausage and some raw milk. And then at lunchtime, I had uh, some, I, I had about uh, 10, 12 ounces of hamburger meat. Mm -hmm. And then at supper, I had uh, some grass-fed uh, kibasi type um, sausage with squash that I cooked in butter. Okay, beautiful. And, um, so I think we're on the right track I here. Um, I just want to, I want to kind of like focus on these meals really quickly because we're definitely on the right track. We're prioritizing a good dose of protein, but I'm not hearing much presence of, you know, those carbohydrates and being very new to this, you know, you're probably coming from very much a carbohydrate kind of sugar dependent metabolism that's used to, you know, the classic things that so many people are eating, you know, maybe breakfast is a bagel and lunch is a wrap and then dinner has a big bowl of rice or potatoes with it. And all of a sudden, you've kind of removed that in a very significant way. You've got a little bit of carbohydrates in there from the raw milk and you've got some on the back end of the day with your squash, which is great. But I think, you know, just hearing that you're starting the day with a workout and then you're ending the day with some volunteer firefighting you, you you're not sedentary completely you know there's a lot of activity here and i'm hearing that maybe there's just not enough total energy here and maybe there's not enough focus on our you know preferred sources of carbohydrates like a little more honey a little more maple syrup a little more fruit or even doubling up that serving of raw milk and adding that glass of raw milk to each meal you know you could throw that in with lunch and dinner too I'm also hearing that there's there's a, a focus and an emphasis here on sausage, and that's that's fine. But also, we might want to prioritize just making sure that that's you know good quality. Sneaky things get into sausages sometimes. You know, there can even be breadcrumbs and gluten lingering in there. So you just want to check the label for that. And maybe with those you know little links that you're having in the morning, let's throw in three eggs as well, and you know throw in some sliced pineapple or get a banana in there too. A little bit extra will go a long way here because what I'm probably probably thinking is happening is that your total energy because you're focusing on protein and you're feeling probably nice and full and satiated, but you've probably quite drastically reduced calories and definitely drastically reduced your carbohydrates, which is just leading to intense fatigue and potentially like a loss of water, which is potentially leading to a loss of electrolytes. And it's just kind of leaving you feeling a little bit down in the dumps. Now, the good news is 
It's, this is not normal, but it's a very easy fix. And I think the fix is prioritizing animal-based foods and honestly just eating more to get started with a particular slant to those foods that I su just suggested. So yeah, maybe a few eggs in the morning with some fruit, um, you know, with that, that, that dinner sounded pretty great, but don't be afraid to just drive up the protein a little bit. You know, if it's six ounces right now, you know, push it up to eight ounces or 10 ounces. So I'm curious, um, you know, how that feels there, Chip, and, and if that is, is a little useful and gives you some direction to move forward with. Okay, uh, and I appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate really, you for calling in. Thank you very much, Chip. Good luck. Eat, eat, okay? Get in, get in those animal-based nutrition, add in those healthy carbohydrates from fruit and honey, and just eat a little bit more, and I think that'll find your balance, and, you know, within a few days, you'll be feeling right as rain, and you'll never look back. So good luck, Chip, and we'll see you soon. Let us know how you go. All right. Next up, we have Noel calling from Connecticut. All right. Are we on the line? Noel or Noel? I'm not sure who we've got here. Please let us know your name and let's hear what you've got for us. Hi there. The name is Noel. Thank you so much for taking my call today. Um, the reason for my call, Steve, is I have been animal-based for a long time. I would say upwards of a year about now. And I used to work on a regenerative agriculture farm. Um, and I've really, really experienced the benefits of nose to tail nutrition and I'm loving it. And I'm almost in a sense wondering if the shoe is ever going to drop at some point. So my question, I guess, to you is, is there any danger in eliminating entire food groups altogether long term? Um, I felt great, um, but there's always that kind of sentiment in the back of my brain that tells me oh maybe there's maybe there's more to this or maybe i'm missing something um so if you could speak to that a little bit that would be awesome yeah noel that's actually a really cool question thanks for asking it and i love that you're into this lifestyle Absolutely. for the long haul and you're in the regenerative space we need more people like you so that's amazing i'm curious what in particular you're potentially wondering about eliminating for the long haul and some drawbacks there. Could you give me some examples of any foods that are present or food groups that are present that, that you're worried about potentially eliminating for the long haul and whether you're missing out on something? Yeah, absolutely. So to start, I would say vegetables for sure. Um, just because I know too, like our ancestors would obviously not gravitate towards plant foods because of plant toxins, but in certain meals, maybe saute vegetables here or there. Um, so, veg so vegetables being one of them. Um, and the second one primarily being grains as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. All right, let's so start those would with... be the two, main, the two main groups. Yeah, let's start with the slightly easier one, which I would say is looking at grains. Um, the, the, the reason that I wouldn't say you're going to lose anything from eliminating grains is we're pretty convinced that they're not really giving us anything, anything of real nutritional value. Can they give mm. us some mouth pleasure at times, you know, a crispy slice of sourdough bread? And can they give us some convenience for keeping our fingers clean while we eat our sunny side up egg sandwich? Sure. But what are they actually giving us in terms of anything that's like nutritionally beneficial? You know, they're not giving us any unique micronutrients or macronutrients they're coming with gluten which we know is a problem for most people and causes leaky gut and disrupts that healthy gut function so are we losing anything by eliminating grains almost certainly not is it the end of the world if every now and then you want to take a slice of sourdough and have it with a Sunday breakfast? Also, no. We've got to remember that we're trying to not be so dogmatic here that you never eat another grain for the rest of your life. But we give you the informed, you know, kind of facts of what it is so you can make the informed decision of knowing that, you know, what I do the most matters most. And you've been in this now, you said, for a year or so. You've already kind of created a state where you're probably balancing and coming into homeostasis and prioritizing our organs with those nutrient-dense foods and you're getting your protein and you've eliminated a lot of the toxins. Now, if you want to go on this little experiment where you throw a little bit of this back in to see how it feels and responds in your body, then the invitation is always there to do it. But with the grain piece, you know, I've been grain free for probably eight years of my life right now. And I don't miss them because there's nothing there that I'm missing out on nutritionally speaking. And they don't agree with my body in particular. And for me, nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. So it's a kind of, it's, it's up to you to do with that what you will. But the question on vegetables gets a little more nuanced. You know, I think you're, you're spot on when you said, 
certainly not the prize food of our ancestors. They was always go for the, you know, anim animal based nutrition, the protein sources, the fats and the beehives, if they could get them, the honeys, the fruits. But of course we, we were hunter and gatherers and we would forage and we would gather some roots and stuff from time to time. And now I think we're looking more so on a toxicity spectrum. You know, the, the, the most digestion friendly plants are probably the ones that I would start to play with introducing if you want it for variety, because I think a very important point in this diet is sustainability. We don't want people to burn out because they get bored of the same meals over and over again because we want people to do this for the long run because we believe that it's the optimal human diet that will lead to optimal health. And we can really lean on that idea again that we can frame this as the 80-20 principle, if you will, that if you get it right 80% of the time, do you really need to sweat the 20% of stuff? And if the 20% of what you're getting wrong, quote unquote, is adding a few vegetables into the mix for some variety because you love the flavor, then that is a very good compromise to make in my book. It will allow you the consistency to do this forever, which is going to make you healthy for the long haul which is a really cool way of looking at it and giving you a little bit more empowerment back that we're not so black and white of, no, you can never eat a piece of broccoli or asparagus ever again. Are they really our friends? Maybe not, but do you love them? And if you love them, is adding them in every now and then going to help you with sustainability on this diet and joy and enjoying your food? Then please feel free to do that. You know, and we always say just cook your vegetables well and listen to your body. And if your body is not agreeing with the food, it's going to tell you. And at this point, a year into this journey, you're probably going to be able to listen to that voice quite well. So just listen, run the experiment, start adding these things back in a little by little, if that's really what you want. And then you'll empower yourself with knowing actually, no, I'm not missing out on anything by adding these things back in because they don't make me feel that great. Or actually, you know, I really like having this in here and there because it's giving me a little more variety and diversity on my plate. So I think ultimately it's, it's about that, you know, it's about informed choice and it's about sustainability and consistency. And we eat a lot, you know, most of us three meals a day, every day, we want to enjoy our food. We want food to be something that's you know beautiful and wonderful and gives us joy and energy and health. All right, Noel, thank you very much for that call. And thank you to all of our callers. We love hearing from you and answering your questions. So we're wrapping up the show. And a call to action that I have for you is to really spend the next few days, the next week, and hopefully that stretches into all areas of your life of really becoming the witness of your mind. Try to watch that self-talk. Try to go looking for those ants. Remember those ants are the automatic negative thoughts. These things that just seemingly bubble up out of nowhere and take up residence in your mind that then you more often believe to be true. And start questioning those, start to create distance and start to really dig of where that comes from. There's an enormous amount of freedom and empowerment in creating that separation from our mind and from our thoughts. So that's what I'll leave you with today. Become the witness of your mind. Create separation. Know that you are not your thoughts and you are not your past. And your future is open and abundant and it's waiting for you if you choose to take that journey. And we're there to support you every step of the way. We'll see you next time. Bye, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We want you to call into the show. So please head over to RadicalHealthRadio.com and there you will find instructions on how to be a part of our show and get your questions answered live. We hope this has been incredibly valuable to you. And if it has, please follow, like, subscribe, and leave us a review on your podcast platform. It helps us spread this message of Radical Health. We'll see you every Wednesday with new episodes. Big love, Radical Health Seekers. See you soon.